Hello everyone, welcome back. Our lesson for today is uh, the early years and education of Jose Rizal. Now, Jose Rizal was born on June 19, 1861. He was born in Calamba, Laguna, and his complete name is actually very long. Uh, it's Jose Protasio Mercado Rizal y Alonso Rialonda. Now, Mercado was the family name of his father. Rizal was the middle name. Alonso was the family name <coughs> of his uh, mother. El Rialonda was also the middle name of his mother. Now, all in all, the Rizal siblings, uh, including Rizal, were 11. There were 11 Rizal siblings. The eldest was Saturnina, followed by Pasano, the only brother of Rizal, and then Narcisa, and then Olympia, and then Lucia, and then Maria, then Concepcion, Josefa, Trinidad, and then Soledad. So these were the, uh, uh, the siblings of Rizal. Rizal only had one brother, and his name was Pasano. And they had a very close uh, relationship. More on this I'll discuss uh, later on. So Rizal's parents were were actually quite rich. Uh, Don Francisco Mercado was his father, originally from Binyan, but then he sought for greener pastures in Calamba, Laguna. Don Francisco married uh, Doña Teodora Alonso, who also belonged to a very well-to-do uh, well, uh, well family. And uh, Doña Teodora Alonso was actually an, edu an educated woman. So his parents played a vital role in the development of Rizal as a child. And, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the traits of Rizal as a kid was that he was considered <clears throat> uh, very mature for his age. He was considered very mature for his age. He, he loved reading books. He loved making uh, sculptures and all those other things. Even his siblings would... Uh, make fun at him because of how serious he was as a child. Now, there was this one story wherein uh, Rizal was uh, in his nipa hut in the backyard of their house, and he was making a sculpture of Napoleon Bonaparte, a bust, I mean, of Napoleon Bonaparte. And while he was making this bust, his sisters, who were playing also uh, at the backyard, uh, saw him. And when they saw him, uh, they laughed and they giggled, thinking that he was, you know, very serious in his craft, very serious in making a bust of Napoleon. Of course, Rizal heard this and uh, said the, the famous words. Uh, he said something like, uh, someday, you know, people will make monuments of me. You just laugh at me now, but someday... People will make monuments of me. And this goes to show that Rizal was also a very ambitious uh, child. He already was thinking that uh, people will make monuments of him in the future. And that they indeed happened. A lot of monuments of Rizal can be found in the Philippines and even outside the Philippines. In the, in, in, in the USA, uh, in Spain, in France, and all the other other places in Europe, even Germany. So Rizal was a very ambitious child. Rizal was also uh, very sensitive. Uh, and that was evinced by, uh, of course, what he said, you know, uh, evinced by his actions. Because he, he felt offended when uh, his sisters laughed at him. And he was a very, very sensitive child. And... Uh, of course, he was a voracious reader. Uh, he loved nature uh, so much. And he was very conscious of his uh, physique, his body. He was very insecure about his body. That's why there was a time when one of his uncles encouraged him to work out and go to the gym. And he did this also. So Rizal grew up basically in Calamba, Laguna. His first tutor was his mother. Doña Teodora Alonso. And then later on, he went to a Latin school in Binyan, uh, 
under a certain uh, uh, teacher, uh, Mr. Uh, Justiniano Cruz, if I'm not mistaken. And then after his stint in Binyan Laguna, uh, after his education in Binyan Laguna, he then went to Ateneo, which I will discuss later on. So, Rizal had two sad experiences uh, during his childhood. The first one was the death of Concepcion. Now, Concepcion was very close to Rizal. Uh, you know, they were very close since Rizal was the seventh child and Concepcion was the, the eighth child. And as they say, siblings that are... Uh, that have a close gap in terms of age uh, turn out to be very close with each other. So that was one of the sad experiences of Rizal because uh, uh, his sister died at an early age. Now, another sad experience of Rizal was when his mother was sent to jail or when his mother was imprisoned. Now, the story behind the imprisonment of his mother is quite interesting. It actually started with the... <clears throat> a marital problem of Teodoro Alonso's brother, Jose Alberto, and his wife. Now, Jose Alberto was a well-traveled man. Uh, he was usually not... Uh, he was usually out of the Philippines most of the time. And uh, <clears throat> because of this, as the story goes, his wife... Uh, found another man and wanted to break up with him. Now, when Jose Alberto returned to the Philippines, he later on found out that his wife was fooling around with another man, so he wanted uh, to break up. Now, he wanted to end the marriage. Now, Doña Tidora Alonso, uh, being a very religious, she was actually a very religious person. Now, even if she was educated, she still respected, you know, the church and the friars. Because at that time, most of the Ilustrados did not like the friars. Uh, some of them even did not respect the church and the friars. That's why they were called as anti-clerical. But suffice it to say, Tidora Alonso was a devout Catholic. And being a devout Catholic, of course, uh, you... You do not want a marriage to, to end. So she tried her best to save the marriage between Jose Alberto and his wife. And as a result, Jose Alberto was convinced and opted not to break up with his wife. But the wife did not like this because maybe the wife already wanted to break up with Jose Alberto. So what the wife did was she accused Doña Teodora of trying to poison her. So she went to the Alferes, reported the incident that Doña Teodora was trying to poison her. And uh, of course, without any due process at all, uh, the Alferes immediately went to Doña Teodora's place in Calamba and arrested her uh, simply because he had a long time grudge on the Rizal family. Now, the Alferes was close to the Rizal family. Uh, before that incident. But uh, something happened between him and the family that, uh, that changed him. And this was, as the story goes, when he, he passed by the Rizal household and tried to ask for father for his horse or food for his horse. But the Rizal family uh, did not give him food because at that time they also lacked food. So the Alferes took this the wrong way and then started to hold a grudge against the Rizal family and was later, I mean, later on thought of a way to get back at them. And when the wife of Jose Alberto reported to, uh, to him about the uh, purported incident uh, of Doña Chidora trying to poison her, her uh, he then took this opportunity to go to Rizal's house and arrest Doña Tudora. So, when she was arrested, she was made to walk for miles to the capital of Laguna, and uh, there she was imprisoned. 
to make the long story short, though, uh, Doña Tudora hired the best lawyers in Manila and was able to uh, was able to uh, get get out of prison eventually. But the damage has already been done. This, in the eyes of Rizal, was a form of injustice. It was an abuse of power. It was an example of a person in authority abusing his power. And Rizal did not like that. And Rizal was deeply affected by the arrest of his mother because his mother did not commit any, any crime and yet she was still arrested without due process. So that affected Rizal that uh, somehow influenced him to uh, fight against any form of injustice. And this this has a very uh, <clears throat> this has a, a a lesson, so to speak. The moral of the story, so to speak, is that we should be careful with our uh, we should be careful with uh, people, especially our friends. And because, as they say, you might you know you might help your friend most of the time, but when you fail to help him or her. Once, if he or she is not a good friend, then that person will always remember the one day that you failed to help him or her. But if he was a good friend, then he would understand and remember most of the days that you, that you helped him or her. So that was one of the catalysts, so to speak. The rest of Doña Tudora Alonso was one of the catalysts uh, as to why Rizal uh, started to fight against any forms of injustice. Now, <clears throat> let us now go to the studies of Rizal in Ateneo de Municipal. Now, it's not necessary for us to look into what Rizal studied in his first year, second year, third year, fourth year. No, not necessary for us to know that. But, we have to take note that uh, when Rizal studied in Ateneo, he almost got all excellent or sobresaliente grades. He actually loved his stay in Ateneo. Uh, his years in Ateneo were considered, he considered his years in Ateneo as his best years uh, uh, in school, so to speak. Uh, so one thing that we have to find out though is why did he perform so well in that school what what triggered him to perform so well <clears throat> well historians would agree that the main reason why he performed so well uh, in Ateneo is that he wanted to prove that a Filipino can be as smart as or even smarter than a Spaniard. He had something to prove. He wanted to prove something. And that he also wanted to break the racial prejudice against Filipinos and prove that they are not inferior compared to the Spaniards. Because at that time, the Spaniards would always look down on us and they would always see us as inferior uh, beings compared to them. Uh, Maybe it had something, to, uh, to, to a large extent, it had, it had something to do with race and the color of our skin. But, you know, what Rizal really wanted to do was he wanted to break, uh, he wanted to break that, uh, uh, that belief that Spaniards were better than Filipinos. So that's the reason why he performed so well in class. And he did, in fact, perform so well. Although he was not the only one, but he performed so well in class. Now, the lessons that he learned in Ateneo, uh, there were quite a number. The first one is that he realized that it is through education that the fatherland can acquire its glory. When we would say the fatherland, it's still debatable whether Rizal was referring to Spain or the Philippines. But the point here is that Rizal saw how important 
education was to the country, to the fatherland, to use his uh, word. Rizal saw the importance of education. Rizal believed that education would not only help the individual, but education would also help the fatherland or the country. So according to him, in order for the Philippines to improve, Filipinos must gain knowledge so that they can see the depressed state of their country and the abuses of Spain. Filipinos must gain knowledge. We must educate ourselves, free ourselves from our ignorance so that we can see what is really happening in the country. And we can, uh, we can uh, see the abuses of Spain or the Spaniards. Now, another thing that Rizal, in connection to this, Rizal also said that once a Filipino has been educated already, then he can serve the Filipino people. One of the things that he must do once he acquires education, once he acquires knowledge, is for them or for him to serve the Filipino people. Take advantage or capitalize on the education that you have acquired and use it for the betterment of the Filipino people, to serve the Filipino people. So by and large, what Rizal was trying to say, you know, the idea that he was trying to impart to us, or the lessons that he learned when he was in Ateneo, was that the prerequisite for improvement is people acquiring knowledge. If you want to improve yourself, you must first acquire knowledge and you must first be educated. And once you acquire knowledge, things will follow. Once you acquire knowledge, of course, you'll be able uh, not only to help yourself, but you will be able to help the fatherland. You will bring glory to the fatherland because you will be serving the Filipino people. And that was his main idea. And that was the lesson that he learned when he was in Ateneo. So by 1877, uh, he, he graduated from Ateneo, went back to Calamba, and there in Calamba, he then uh, thought of what course he might take for college. And there were three potential jobs, three potential uh, <clears throat> uh, careers or prof uh, profession that, that he may or he can choose from. The first one is to become a priest. The second one is to become a lawyer. And the third one was to become a doctor. Of course, being a priest was, uh, we can say it was out of the picture for Rizal. Being a lawyer, on the other hand, you might think that this would have uh, been good for Rizal. Because he was uh, a voracious reader, he was very articulate, he wrote well. So you might think that he would have, you know, been a, a good lawyer, but he did not choose to become a lawyer, but chose the third one. He chose to become a doctor. Although he was not particularly uh, good uh, when it comes to his studies in University of Santo Tomas, his grades were not as good as Ateneo when he took up medicine in Santo Tomas. But the reason why he chose to become a doctor was that he wanted to help his mother. His mother had an eye illness and he wanted to help her out. So Rizal decided to become a doctor in order to help his mother. So... By 1877, uh, Rizal then went to uh, University of Santo Tomas. And in Santo Tomas, his experiences there were not as good as Ateneo. But again, I would like to emphasize on the lessons that he learned in uh, UST. These are the lessons that Rizal learned in UST. The first one is the 
the atmosphere at that time in the school and the attitude of the Filipino students. Now, according to Rizal, Filipino students accepted injustice without criticism because there is no other way of life. And Rizal saw this as wrong. Uh, in fact, the attitude of the students depressed him as much as the behaviors of the friars. The students at the time, when, whenever they saw any form of injustice, they would just remain silent. They would not do anything. They would not criticize it. They would not speak out against it. Because to them, there was no other way of life. To them, that was what they were accustomed to. And they were simply afraid. Fear paralyzed them from doing uh or stop them from doing things that should have been done. I mean, it behooved them to speak out against any form of injustice, but they did not do anything about it. So, as a result of this, Rizal then inferred that not all faults lay with the friars. Much of it lay with the Filipino people for being subservient. And I think, I believe, this is... Uh, relevant to what is happening in our society, in Philippine society nowadays. Because the problem with our society is not really with the government, although it would be best if uh, the government would uh, change or there would be reforms in government. But another problem is that the people keep on voting for those people in power, for those political elites to remain in power. Corruption has always been the perennial problem in the Philippines, but what are we doing about it? We are still electing and voting for corrupt individuals. We are still subservient to them. We cannot speak out against them. We cannot criticize them or we refuse to criticize them because of our misplaced loyalty. When I say misplaced loyalty, it's simply because to some of us, we see, or to most of us, we see things, things as black and white. Uh, what do I mean by this? Say, for example, you don't like the Aquinas, so you vote for the Marcoses. You don't like the Marcoses, so you vote for the Aquinas or the Liberal Party candidate. And that's not how things should be. It's not how things should be. So we must always speak out against any form of injustice. We must always speak out against corruption. And we must not consider this as activism that is uh, synonymous to uh, communism or synonymous to being a leftist and an NPA. No, it's not like that. In fact, those people also want uh, change, although they have other means of trying to achieve it. So... The main problem here, according to Rizal, is that the people have to do something about the problem. They have to speak out. They have to uh, play a role in society. They must not continue to be subservient. And that is still very relevant at present. Now, Resignation is not always a virtue, according to Rizal. These, he was referring to the apathetic individuals. It is a crime when it encourages tyranny. When those apathetic individuals enable tyranny. So lastly, he then said, there are no tyrants where there are no slaves. So this is something very, uh, this is something very important to take note of. Because if we continue to be enslaved by these tyrants and if we allow to be enslaved by these tyrants then there will be no change in the country there will be no reforms corruption will still remain people in power who are corrupt will still remain in power and as the filipino people we will continue to suffer and what is happening now is uh, we are we are repeating a cycle a deleterious cycle, so to speak, in politics as we continue to vote for people who we know in history are corrupt and have not done anything good for the Filipino people. And yet we choose them simply because we see things as black and white, simply because of our misplaced loyalty. And we vote for these people. We enable them. Our apathy 
enables them. Our misplaced loyalty puts them in power. So that's the problem. And that's why I, I think Rizal's lessons that he learned in UST are still very applicable in today's society. Now, the respect for truth was one of the lessons that Rizal and his siblings learned from his parents. Now, what do we mean by this? Well, it's simple. What his parents were trying to tell, tell them was that no matter what you do in life, you must always tell the truth. Even if it is very difficult to do, you must tell the truth no matter what. And this might be the reason one can infer that Rizal wrote his books, the Noli and the El Filibus Terismo. Those books, even if they were works of fiction, spoke of the truth on what was really happening in Philippine society during his time. But when Rizal spoke the truth, of course, uh, the ramification was uh, quite bad. Of course, since he spoke the truth against the Spaniards, uh, he was then inevitably arrested and, of course, tried. And then it was decided by the court that he would be executed by a firing squad. At, this was the expense. This was the, the effect, so to speak, of telling the truth. And that's why today, at present, many people are afraid to tell the truth. Many people just uh, do not speak up because they are afraid that something bad might happen to them. If they will tell the truth, if they will speak out against corruption or if they witness a form of corruption done by their boss or their superiors, they, they would just uh, pretend not to know about it because they're afraid to to go against people in authority because either they would be uh, they would lose their jobs or the worst case scenario is that they would be silenced and killed and uh, of course Rizal paid the price for telling the truth and he was eventually silenced by the friars with the help of the colonial government, he was also executed. I mean, it led to his execution. And, you know, it might be very idealistic to say this, that we should follow Rizal and tell the truth all the time. But, you know, we have to do the right thing, especially uh, in this day and age in Philippine society that uh, our government... Uh, has been plagued by a lot of corruption cases and the people uh, in power are also very corrupt and uh, they are taking advantage of our silence. They're taking advantage of our apathy. Uh, they are using their power to control us and that shouldn't be the case because they are there because of us. We elected them. Uh, power should not be monopolized by them. Going back to Rizal, uh, <clears throat> Rizal would always make it the point to tell the truth. And that cost him his life. So the question now is, would you, uh, would you sacrifice your life for the truth? I mean, most of us would say, no way. But we can never achieve genuine change if people do not speak out, if we are afraid of the people in power. So I guess we have a thing or two to learn from Rizal. And this is one of them. Uh, respect for truth. We must always, always speak out we must always tell the truth because if we don't we only allow these corrupt 
uh, politicians to remain in power. The next value, the next lesson that Rizal learned from his parents is respect for religion. Now, when we say respect for religion, Rizal learned from his parents that he and his siblings should respect all types of religion, whether it be Islam, Protestantism, Catholicism, Hinduism, Buddhism, and all the others. No matter what you do, you must always respect religion. And this is uh, not surprising because his parents were devout Catholics. His mother, as I've mentioned before, was a devout Catholic. And they would always respect the church and they would always respect the friars, even if they knew about the abuses of the friars, but, you know, uh, they didn't do anything about it. This might sound very uh, ironic because they taught their children to respect the truth and speak out, but then, uh, of course, they did not really speak out against the abuses of the friars. But, of course, Rizal did that. And Rizal really learned a lot from his parents. In fact, he was very close to his mother, Donia Tidora. Okay. Now let us look into the early romances of Rizal. I will just go through this in brevity. Now, the early romances of Rizal. Many historians today would like to rom romanticize the, uh, the early uh, romances of Rizal uh, by putting or making labels on the, the girls that he, that he loved before. Uh, the first one was Segunda Katigbak. Now, Segunda Katigbak was considered by Rizal historians as Rizal's uh, uh, first love. But if you look at their story, if you look at the diary of Rizal and, and, and you read their story, it was more or less just like, a, it was a mere infatuation. Rizal was merely infatuated by Segunda Katigbak, but he could not do anything about it because Segunda Katigbak was already engaged to someone else. But later on, uh, Rizal met Leonor Rivera and historians would refer to Leonor Rivera as his uh, true love. And Lino Rivera, admittedly, was the inspiration of uh, Maria Clara, one of the characters of Rizal in the Noli and the El Fili. So Maria Clara was, of course, the love interest of the uh, protagonist of the Noli and the El Fili, uh, uh, Chrysostomo Ibarra, who later on became Simon in El Filibusterismo. Rizal was not contented with his years in University of Santo Tomas. He stayed in Santo Tomas for five years. He almost finished his course on medicine, but he decided to leave the school by 1882 because he thought that the knowledge that he can acquire in Santo Tomas was limited. And of course, as, as he said in Ateneo, for a person to improve himself, he must be able to acquire knowledge. But he thought that he could not improve himself that much when he was studying University of Santo Tomas. So he decided to go into a mission, so to speak. Uh, he wanted to go to Europe and study in the different universities there, get to know the culture of the Europeans, especially in Spain and improve himself in Europe. So Rizal felt that he had a sense of duty to do something of service to the Filipino people. So in doing so, he must leave the Philippines. As again, he thought that he could not improve himself here, given the limited education. So he left the Philippines to study ophthalmology in Europe and to know more about Spain and other countries in the continent. Now, this was a secret plan. He did not tell his parents about this, and it was only Pashano who knew about it, and one of the sisters of Rizal. Now, 
Jose and Pashano had a secret agreement in which one of them would remain in Calamba to support the family and of course to support the other one who would go to Europe and study. Of course, Pashano was the one who stayed in Calamba and Jose was the one who would go to Europe uh, and study medicine. Now, Pashano was the one supporting Jose in his stay in Europe. And uh, Jose was actually very, very fortunate. Our national hero, Serizal, was very fortunate to have Pashano support him all the way. So his parents, again, did not know. He left the Philippines on a secret mission, so to speak. Because he decided that once he'd finished his course there in Spain and in France and then in Germany, he, he, he wanted to go back to the Philippines and serve the Filipino people and also help uh, cure his mother's eye illness. So he left the Philippines with a heavy heart as he also left behind his lover, Leonor Rivera. That ends our discussion for uh, this certain or this particular lesson. Uh, we'll discuss more on the other topics later on. But for now, I would like you to reflect and take note of the things that I have discussed. And for me, when we, when we study history, and especially the, the life of Rizal, for me, what is important to remember are the uh, the lessons that uh, Rizal formulated when he was in Ateneo and when he was in Santo Tomas. And of course, the lessons that Rizal learned from his parents. So again, sum it all up. In Ateneo, Rizal said that education, it is through education that the fatherland can acquire its glory. If you want to improve yourself, you have to acquire knowledge. And after acquiring knowledge, after improving yourself, the education that you have acquired can be used for the glory of the fatherland. And then you can serve the Filipino people. In Santo Tomas, he learned that not all the faults lay with the friars, much of it lay with the Filipino people because of their apathy, because they do not do anything about the injustices done either by the friars or uh, the, uh, uh, the colonial government. So Rizal realized that much of the fault lay with the Filipino people. And that is still very applicable and very relevant today. We cannot really blame the politicians of today why our system, our government is very corrupt. Of course, they are the corrupt ones, so we should blame them. But no, one of, you know, the people that we should be blaming also is ourselves because we continue to vote for them. Because we do not speak out against them, because we are afraid of them. So these are the things that we should learn. And then the next one, the last one, the respect for truth that Rizal learned from his parents. And this is very, very important nowadays, especially during this time. Uh, it's election season in the Philippines. And candidates are expected to tell the truth. But it seems that honesty is not being valued anymore. By, by some politicians. It seems that telling the truth is not being valued anymore. It seems that the leading candidates now in the local and at the national level are not telling the truth and yet people are still voting for them. Because of what? What reasons? They don't even have reasons for it. Well, some of them have reasons for it based on history, but history that is not true. 
history that is uh, fabricated by paid propagandists. And so we have to be very particular with this lesson. We must, like what Rizal did and like what his siblings did, learn from Doña Teodora and Don Francisco. We must always respect the truth. We must always tell the truth. We must always seek for the truth. Especially nowadays in the advent of social media, a lot of false uh, information is being spread. And we are enabling it. Some of us are even sharing it, even if it's false. And when we are corrected, and when someone who knows about it, historians or academics or fact checkers, would correct the person sharing fake news, as they say, they then, I mean, the people sharing these false information would then play the victim and then would concomitantly result to smart shaming, telling the, the person who corrected them that in, in the vernacular, oh, ikaw na lagi bright, ilas ka, ikaw na lagi kinabrightan. And that's not, that's not good. I've been I've been teaching for more than a decade already. I've been teaching history for more than a decade and uh, I think there is a problem with our society now because of all the misinformation and disinformation. And I'll I'll leave you with this analogy, no? Imagine as teachers we always try to correct students, right? If they commit mistakes, if they make mistakes, we we always correct them. And we tell them that oh that's not, that's, that's not right. This is the correct answer. Especially in essays and all the other, in exams or in oral recitations. We correct the students. But then you don't, you don't see, you don't, you don't hear the students telling the teacher, oh, ikaw na lagi bright, ma'am. You, you don't hear students say that, right? Students accept the correction and they learn from it. No? Huh? They learn from it. They accept it. So imagine if you're the teacher and you're correcting your students and then the students would criticize you and would go against you and would smart shame you. How would you feel? Wouldn't feel right, diba? But some of you are doing that. Not only students, but some teachers are doing that. So I want you all to reflect. But now with the advent of social media, and with social media being a cesspool of misinformation and disinformation, I want you to ask yourself, would you allow yourself to be a victim of such misinformation and disinformation? Would you allow yourself to become a victim of false history, fabricated history? We have to distinguish what is true from what is false. So ask your history teachers if you have, if you need something to be clarified, if you saw something in social media about our country's history that you want to be clarified on, ask your history teachers. And if you are not satisfied with their answers, and even if you have asked them already, you try to do your own research because some teachers are or tend to be very tendentious, tend to be very biased. So do your own research also. You're capable of doing that. And if you doubt the answers of your teachers, do further research. Read books, history books. Try to do your research online and search for scholarly peer-reviewed journals. And uh, uh, try to know about our history by yourself. Because some teachers admittedly uh, even do not know 
what really happened in our country's past. Admittedly, some of them are not so knowledgeable about it. Some of them believe in fabricated history, false history, simply because of their biases. So, educate yourself. Like what Rizal did for you to improve yourself, you must educate yourself. You must acquire knowledge. Real knowledge. Not knowledge based on uh, falsified information. So please take time to reflect on the lessons that I have imparted in this uh, lecture. And I hope that eventually you will realize that uh, until now there is still something wrong uh, in our country and something must be done. Something must be done. So thank you all for listening to this lecture. Next week, we'll be, we'll be having our midterm exam. I will be posting the coverage uh, later on in our Google Classroom. So please study the coverage and uh, please also join the Edmodo group that I'll be creating uh, this week because you will be answering your midterm exam in that Edmodo group. So please study and I hope that you will do well in the midterm exams next week. You have to pass uh, the exam. You need to. The passing is uh, over 80. The passing is 40. Over 80. So at least get the passing score or even better, try to get a perfect score. All right. Thank you all for listening and have a great day. Goodbye.